Father, here we are once again at this preaching moment. Lord, you know the hearts of your people. You know the minds. You know what we all need to hear. We need a word from you. We hear politicians. We hear people making promises that they can't keep. But we know you're the great promise keeper. And so, Lord, we need a word from you. We need a word to stimulate our minds, to stimulate our hearts, and to anchor our faith. We're grateful that by your grace we will make it home someday. So as we walk through this valley that we're in, we pray that you would continue to lead us and guide us and direct us. Lord, somebody's burden was too heavy. Somebody's night was too long. Somebody asked the world to stop spinning so they could get off. Lord, breathe on us today that you would breathe life into where life needs to be breathed into, that you would breathe hope into hopeless conditions. And Lord, that you would give us joy in your salvation because we're grateful to you because of what you've already done and our faith is latched on to you because you've shown yourself to be true in other situations. And so we know that you'll bring us through and we're grateful for it in Jesus' name. Speak now. Speak now. Amen. Amen. I was, uh, I was out of town this week, traveling different places. I went to Phoenix, and I went to Atlanta, and I got back last night. Uh, but I still did all my duties. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, we, had, we still did our Bible study. I want you to pray with me because I, uh, this coming Tuesday, I have to go to Team Challenge in San Francisco. They want me to come and speak over there. Um, so, you know, a lot of times you don't never know where God is going to send you to. But we need to be ready to go wherever he sends us. And a lot of times we so often want people to come to us, but we need to go to them. The Bible says go into all the world. And if you go, they'll come. But if we have a bunker mentality, you know what that is? Where you sit down and you just, uh, a bunker is where you hide and fortify yourself and so nobody can get in. We want, we want to invite people to have what you already claimed in Christ because the world needs what you have. And we're here to talk about that because God wants us to go. Uh, I'll tell you all the time, I don't have a problem going. I'll go to somebody's picnic. I'm invited to go to somebody's picnic to speak at the, uh, that for their birthday uh, in a couple of Saturdays. They'll come by, I want you to say some words at my birthday. That's where we need to go. If you notice what Jesus did, he went to the temple, but when he left the temple, he went to who? He went to people. So we need to build relationships so that people will know that you actually love them and that you care about them. I'm about relationships, and I'm about that because Jesus Christ is about relationships. God himself ordained relationships. He ordained family and community. So we need to understand that we have a bigger purpose than just coming on Sundays. We, have, we come on Sundays to be equipped to go out on Mondays and to go to what they call Maldi Monday, Terrible Tuesday, whatever those things <laughs> they have for every day of the week, and then come back on Sunday and get refueled again. In the middle of the week, we have Bible studies so you can get fueled up again to go into the world to preach the gospel to every creature, not by lip service, but by our lives. Everybody can talk. I was reading um, this book called The Ways of God by uh, Richard Blackaby. I was at the airport yesterday and I saw it and I started reading the introduction. He says something very profound in there. Too often we try to win the world by looking like the world. Why would the world come to an imitation? We want to win the world by having light shows, by having the same kind of music and the same kind of beat. We want to attract them with physical things, but that is superficial. We need to attract them by the Spirit of God in our lives. They want real. They don't want fake. Why would I want something that looked just like me? I wouldn't even marry me. <laughs> I want somebody to, that's going to help me to be better than me. I ain't saying I'm not good marriage material. Don't get me wrong. But I don't want to marry me. I want somebody that will meld with me and may help me be better as God has designed me to be. You know, God designed you to be in relationships. And the marriage relationship, I didn't mean to go there, is 
is symbolic of the church because he calls the church his bride. And he's getting his bride ready for the great wedding feast. That's why marriage is such a wonderful thing because he's getting the church ready for the marriage feast. And it's a marriage feast. It's a celebration. That's why we celebrate marriages because it's two people coming together becoming one. And that's how he talks about us in the body, that we are all different and unique, but we become one in the body following the head. I'm preaching that right now. We need to understand that, and we understand that we are in relationship with each other so that we can reach the world because they're looking for love. The song says you're looking for love in all the wrong places. You're looking for love in material things, material possessions, and they fail. I don't want to alarm you, but you know the little money you have in the bank, they can push a button and it's all gone. We don't know that they went to a debit society, a debit economy, and that the dollar, they don't even want you to spend paper money no more. Have you noticed that? We are in a situation where we have lost all control of what we thought we have control of. So we need to depend upon God, and we need to send hope out to the world that there is God. He is the God who will meet your needs, whatever they are. He met your needs in the past, haven't he? He brought you through many dangerous toils and snares, and you're still here. He brought you through sickness and disease. You're still here. He brought you through heartaches. He lost loved ones. He brought you through heartaches, and he still heals your heart, and he gives you the strength to move on. I'm, I'm, I was encouraged. I'm going to say this, Sister Patricia, not to get you sad. I was encouraged when we had, were at the house and we were all around Pat's bed. And in that moment, he was praying and singing. That gave me hope. Didn't it give you hope? It gave me hope that it was not going to be a situation where there was hopelessness. I don't, he wasn't holding on like this. I don't want to go. He didn't go out of here screaming. He went out singing and praying. That was a testimony. If you weren't there, you would have seen something that was beautiful. In a sad situation, there was joy because he showed me hope. And I've been by many bedsides of people who are dying, and everybody don't go that way. You ought to be happy that we witnessed that. It's sad, but it's go joy because now I know he was singing about where he was going. I never heard Pat sing. Matter of fact, uh, Joe Horn told me that Pat didn't want to sing here. <laughs> He like me. I don't want to sing. <laughs> I have to. <laughs> um, but he was singing and praying, and he prayed for everybody. And he prayed for his family, and he, he prayed for himself. That spoke volumes to me. I don't know why I'm saying that, but maybe you need to be encouraged this morning that whatever we're going through, he's going to bring us. And even though we walk through the very valley of the shadow of death, I don't have to fear no evil because he is with me. He's with me. So we're thankful to God for all of you. Pray for me as I go to uh, Teen Challenge to have a word for them. Pray for us that we have a word here. Pray for us that God would bring us together. You know, uh, I'm going to say this. I, I'm not going to keep you long today. We're already 1210. I'm just going to introduce this next part of our, 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 our series. Um, but he, I've got what I'm going to say now. But we're here, and we're glad that he brought us here. But as we go out into the world, we need to be an example. We need to be real. So that's why God impressed upon me to talk about practical Christianity. Practical Christianity. Turn, turn with me to James, the second chapter. Verse 12 through 26, that's our scripture that we're reading today, and we're going to take one portion of that. Stand with me as we read the scripture. James 12, James 2nd chapter, verse 12 to 26, so speak and so do, as those who will be judged by the law of liberty, for judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What does it profit, my brother, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say to them, depart in peace and be warmed and filled, but you do not give them things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. 
show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble, but do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham justified by works when he offered Isaac, his son, on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. May God add a blessing to the hearing and reading and doing of his word. You may be seated. We spoke about last week that there were three, practic- there's three stages of, pra- of, of practical Christianity, the thinking stage, the being stage, and the doing stage. The thinking is what we're talking now where you're receiving a message. It's going to be, in, you're going to come through your ears and your eyes. You're going to see somebody speaking. You're going to hear somebody saying something. And the words are going to penetrate into your intellect, into your very being, and it's going to give you some understanding. So thinking is the intellectual, the reasoning, and the understanding part of who we are. The being is who we actually are and who we are becoming. Once we get to the thinking part, we internalize what God says, and he transforms us. He takes us from being a caterpillar into being a beautiful butterfly. I couldn't stand caterpillars when I was young. They, they were, ugh, I still can't. I'm not good with bugs anyway. Bugs, snakes, lizards, all them things. If you bring a bug in here, you, you probably see me scream. So don't do that. Don't have me doing that. But a caterpillar is ugly. But later on, you will love butterflies because the, bu- the patap- caterpillar is transformed into something that it was not before. That's what God does to you. He transforms you from being at something ugly, something deformed, into something perfect and clean because he cleans you up. He transforms you so you become just like that butterfly appealing and beautiful and somebody can hold on to. People like pictures of butterflies. I don't see nobody with a picture of a caterpillar on their mantle, but they have pictures of butterflies. So the being is a part of us after we hear what God has to say, he transforms us, and not only that, he conforms us. He transforms us from what we were, and then he conforms us, he makes us look like him. And that moves us to the doing piece. We live what we say. We practice what we preach. Doing is living in action, and this activity, living purposely by example and action, living out the transformed character. is action speaking louder than words. He said, let your light shine, not your lips. Putting on lip gloss will make you cook clean. Just make you have shiny lips. But your light comes from the inside, and it shines out, and it transforms you. And people look at you and say, why do you have that glow about you? It's not about your physical appearance. It's about what happened inside of you that shines outside. Practical is of or concerned with the actual doing or use of something rather than theory ideas. We're not here for just to simply promote some ideas of how you should live. We're promoting what God says you ought to live, that he will give you the ability to live, that he will train you so you can live, so that you can be a magnet, you can attract other people who want to change like you, you exhibit. Practical is relating to actual experience or the use of knowledge. What God gives you, then you act it out, is in activities rather than just simply knowledge or an idea. Too often we come to church and we deal in ideals. We deal deal in an idea, but we don't think that we have the victory to live a transformed life. I don't say a perfect life where you're going to walk without tripping. you, You may not always keep your temper. The Bible says be angry, but don't sin. That means you have the capacity to be angry. Too often people want to put you in a box that they can't live in. But what he will do, he'll continue to conform you that you get better, and that that what tripped you up before will not trip you up again. So he... He tells us that he he gives us the ability to transform us to be better than what we came in with. So we have to ask the question, why do we come to church? 
Why does the church exist? What is the purpose of the church? How should the church glorify God? How should the church represent God? How should the church live? And how should the church look to those outside the church? Because we're called to the world. We're called to go out in the world. He says you're in the world, but you're not of the world. You're in the world to influence the world from what they were to who you need to be. Salt influences meat. Salt influences everything it touches. Light influences darkness. Light dispels darkness. It's an influencer, and we're called to be light and salt. We're called to influence. In James, he deals with the practical, uh, the, how to live practically as a follower of Christ, and he contrasts faith. Last week, we talked about speaking and acting, the law of liberty that frees. And we're not going to go through that again, but I just want to lead up to where we are now. Uh, the law of liberty, you have, you're not in the law of bondage. The law of liberty means that you got free, and now you need to let other people be free. He said, if you want to obtain mercy, you must be merciful. If you want to obtain forgiveness, you must be able to forgive. We have a hard time with that. If families are to be healed, they got to learn how to forgive. If the communities are to be healed, we got to let certain things go. You know, we, we get hurt. And you know, some of the worst hurt is church hurt. Because you come to church, you don't realize that church is a, a place for sick people to get well. We expect them to be well, and we, we hold them to a different standard. So they do something here, and I ain't coming back to church. Well, if the church was perfect and you came, you made it imperfect because you're imperfect. When the Bible speaks of perfect, he talks about being mature and being complete. And we will not be complete while we're in this world. We're moving to perfection, to completion and maturity in Christ. So he says to speak and act in, the, in, in verse uh, 12, uh, he says, speak and act as those who will be judged by the law of liberty, the liberty that freed you. See, when you come to Christ, he sets you free from sin. He puts you on a path of liberty, of freedom. Liberty means you're free. He sets you free. He breaks the shackles that you had. He sets you free. He starts breaking habits that you had. I had a cussing habit. I cussed like a drunken sailor. I wasn't even drunk. I could not stop using those words, and I wanted to stop. I got saved, I said, and I, even though I got saved, I was still cussing. You know, so I, I, people want to act like they like this. No, I, I had some things that needed to be cleaned up. And I, was, I couldn't stop cussing. Couldn't stop smoking, smoking weed either, but that's the other story. And I was cussing, and I, and I was getting so discouraged because I wanted to break the habit. You know, it takes a while to break habits. I'm just being real. It takes a while to break habits. I couldn't stop cussing. And I was praying, and it looked like God wasn't even helping me. Have you ever felt that way? You're praying for something, you're praying for something, and something seemed to happen. Then all of a sudden it happens. One day I was working as a groundskeeper at Stanford. I was trying to get a job, too. I thought I was better than being a groundskeeper because I had a college degree. But God humbled me. <laughs> I needed a job. I had a, I had a wife and, and a kid. And so I was a groundskeeper. I was raking leaves at Stanford with a college degree. And one day I grabbed hold to the mower to put it on the truck, and I grabbed the muffler. We had just finished cutting. He grabbed my hand. I said, oh. And I looked at myself, and I was happy because I didn't cuss. I did not know when it was broken, but he broke the power. That's the transforming power of Christ, where some, all of a sudden what you've been trying to get free from, he set you free from. That's the law of liberty. So uh, when I first got saved, I, was, I didn't want nobody cussing around me. I still don't want people cussing around me, but who am I to tell you how to talk to me? I don't cuss, and you know what that happens? Then they say, oh, I, I don't mean to say that. But uh, I understand from my own experience, it's a habit. God has to break that habit. I can't tell you, don't cuss around. Who am I? I need to influence them, not dictate. You don't cuss around me. You know, I'm a preacher. You know, I'm a preacher. Don't cuss around me. I don't want you cussing around me, but I need to, if I just push you away, I can never win you. But he says we are in the law of liberty. So we need to speak and act who he's making us to be. And we need to understand that whatever we have struggled with, whether it's drug addiction, alcohol, anything else that we've been struggling with, and he frees us from that, we ought to have some empathy for other people because they're going through those kind of things. You won't hear that in a lot of churches today. I'm just being real. They want to get you shouting and all that kind of stuff. And I love people to shout, but we need really something that, what is God telling us? So he says, speak and act in the way he's making you, he's transforming you to be. 
Today I want to talk to you about that number two, living or active faith must be held together with deeds of faith. Faith without deeds is dead. Living or active faith must be held together with deeds of faith. When he says faith without works, he's saying that if you have faith, it's going to show by how you live and how you act. That's what people understand. I have faith, but, I, 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 but they have an intellectual faith. They have a theoretical faith. They have an ideal. They believe in God, but they believe in God way out there, not God that comes near to you. They don't believe in God, the God that can heal you, that can touch you, that can lift you. They believe in the idea of God. I know that there's a higher power, the man above. They use all these different terms that are impersonal, but God is personal. So a living or active faith must be held together with deeds of faith. Deeds of faith is not effective for salvation, but the deeds of faith demonstrate the validity of your claim to be a follower of Christ. If he changes you and he makes you different, that people recognize the difference, they're going to ask you what happened. I love it when they say, I remember when you, you used to do. Yeah, I did used to do those things. And I'm ashamed of him. But I'm also happy because he changed me. I'm a used to be. I'm an ex this and an ex that because he makes me new and he can make you new too. So the deeds of faith is not effective for salvation, but they show the deeds of salvation. They show the validity that of you saying you're a follower of Christ. Your actions will dictate whether you're really a follower of Christ. In verse 14. I'm talking about practical Christianity, how to win the loss. Verse 14, James says, what does it profit, my brother, if you say, if some says he has faith but does not have works, can faith save him? That's a rhetorical question. He wanted you to think about. We use that word faith so liberally and so, and so, and we use it in a way that doesn't express truth. We use it from an intellectual perspective. I have faith. And so then he, he talks about that, he asks this rhetorical question, what good is it if you claim you have faith, but nothing shows? I can demonstrate my faith in that chair because I believe that chair can hold my weight, so what I do? I act on my faith. I get in my car, I believe my car going to start, and when it don't start, I'm disappointed because I got into it and I, it's supposed to start, it's supposed to do something, so I get in my car and I push the ignition and it starts up and I put it in gear and it goes. If it lets me down, I'm disappointed. My faith in what that car is supposed to do causes me to act in a certain way while I have confidence in that car, am I right? So your faith should, ch should show you to have confidence in God and to put your weight on him so he can change you so you can be a light to somebody else. So James asked this rhetorical question of the believer. What good is it if a person claims they have faith but has nothing to show for it? Or what benefit is it to claim you have faith but is not backed up in practice? James' purpose was to try to provoke us to thinking, to thought and examination, and he poses two questions in this that is central to every believer. Can that type of faith save them? And the next question is, what profit or benefit is a faith that is not congruent with or that does not move a person to actions? He says that faith can't save you. What he's talking about is a dead faith is just that dead. It has no activity. It can't move you. It can't move nobody else. All that faith is just to look at and, and walk by and then bury it. That's what we do to dead things. It can't move. It doesn't respond. A dead faith does not respond. It does, it's not living. It's not active. It doesn't move. But if you're living and active, you can move and breathe and have impact and influence on other people. So he says, can that kind of faith save you? Verse 14. He said, what does it profit? What benefit is it if somebody says they have faith but does not have works? <coughs> what he's saying is, you saying I have faith, but there's no evidence of it. We need evidence. The world needs evidence that God is real. The world needs evidence that God can do what he says he can do. And you are the evidence that God can do what he says he can do. That's why I use the example of Pat. In his gone moments, his faith was shown by what he was doing. 
and that was encouraging. He says, can a faith save them? In other words, can a faith that does not prompt a person to action, is that a saving type of faith? Is that saving faith or is it simply lip service? Is this just gratuitous meandering that lacks sincerity? Does this type of faith show love, care, and mercy? Too often, we're concerned with tradition and rituals and religious practices that lend itself to feelings of superiority or self-importance. I'm reminded of the religious people in Jesus' day. They look down on other people saying, you're not as good as we are. Two men went up to the temple and prayed. One was a Pharisee, religious leader, and one was a public and an outcast. The Pharisee prayed like this, Lord, I thank you that I'm here. I thank you that I give tithes of everything I possess. Uh, I go to church every Sabbath day, and I'm thankful that I'm not like this person next to me, this publican. And then the publican simply bowed his head and said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. The publican, the outcast, the one that was no good, the one that was looked down upon, recognized his condition, and he prayed in that way. The religious person looked down on everybody else. You're not as good as me. You're clean. You're dirty. I'm clean. Look how I dress. Look how I walk in. And we got to be careful that we don't take that kind of attitude because we need to reach. That's why I liked what we did with the, the, uh, the kids. They were given to some people, not simply just to do an outward thing, but because care motivates that. So your faith should move you to action. It should prompt you to action. We're not here simply to be religious and to go through the ritual. That's why the communion is not a ritual. It is actually a remembrance that what God did. So James is more concerned with us living the right way and not being self-important, not thinking we're better than other people, not being totally absolved from people, not being separate from people, but being welcoming so that they can see the love of Christ that can change their life. Practical Christianity will cause a change in your family, in your community, in your work, wherever you are. People will notice you because you're different. You're not like everybody else. He calls you out of the world and sends you back into the world. Practical application of faith is a real example that the faith we have, we, that we profess, is what we have. The second question is, what does it profit or benefit what profit or what benefit is a faith that is not congruent with or that does not move a person to action? And he gives you an example. Now, some people will use this and say, he says, do this to people. This is how you prove that you love them. But he was, this is an example that he's given. He wants you to see how, how faith would move a person to action. And he, he uses a church setting. If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, all around us, right in your congregation, if there's somebody destitute of daily food or you know they have a need, but you say to them, look, I'm praying for you, but you do nothing. You have the means, you have the abil ability, you see the need, and love should prompt you to meet the need if you can. He didn't say be used by people, but you see somebody in a condition. He says they're naked, don't have clothes, and they're destitute. That means they can't even afford to get a meal. And one of you say to them, go in peace. Shalom. Warm and be filled but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body. What good is that? What good is me saying I'll pray for you and I have the means to meet your need? What good is it if I say, you say, well, I'm not feeling well or I need a ride, and I say, well, I hope you get what I'm praying for you and you're hoping somebody else pick them up? What good is it if somebody say, I need you to come and pray with me, but, you know, I'm watching a warrior game and now I'm sad because they lost? What good is that? Is that real faith? Is that practical faith? Faith will cause you to sacrifice for uh, what you have to go help somebody else. The same faith that m moved Christ, the same action that moved Christ will motivate your faith. What profit is it? James gives this example to illustrate a point. A word of blessing without an act of blessing is like the promise of salvation without the saving act of God. What good is a promise that I'll save you and he doesn't die on the cross? What good is a promise that I'll heal you and he don't come by? What good is his promise if he's not going to act on his promise? A word of blessing without the act of blessing, if I have the ability to meet somebody's need that really needs, and everybody don't need now, I'm to be, be discerning, but if I, I'm right here even in this body, 
if I have the, the ability to meet a need because somebody needs it, I don't need to trumpet it. Now, that's another thing he didn't do. You don't trumpet and say, well, I'll just help so-and-so. You got to help the next one. No, you do it because you see a need and you don't care that it be trumpeted. You move, your faith caused you to move in mercy and cause you to move in love and cause you to act on that love that you have. What good is saying, go ahead, depart in peace, be warned, be filled, but you don't do anything when you see that they need it. What, is that a benefit to that person? Does that benefit that person? It don't benefit them or you. What benefit is this type of faith to the church and the world? Is this real saving faith? Our faith that leads to salvation is predicated on the deeds of Christ. The promise of salvation must be followed by the act of salvation. If somebody's drowning in the ocean and you walk by, hold on, I'll get somebody else to save you, but you got the you in the boat and you can throw a life raft, but you're waiting for somebody to do it, How's that, that person is still in the, in the water. We need to pull them out. I have the means. I got the boat. I got the, 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 the little raw round thing. I don't go out in the water, uh, whatever that thing is. And you, you hold on to that, and then we're we going to pull you in here, and then we're going to get some help. We're going to both get help. I'm going to help you get out of the water so you won't drown because I'm, I'm in a place of safety. Now we can both move. So by saying, I'll wait right there, I'll be right back, and they still dog paddling, that doesn't help them. If a brother or sister needs and you don't do it, then that shows you have a dead faith. If we do not act in connection to what we profess, is that saving faith? Is that a living faith? And he ends that with faith without deeds is a dead faith. <coughs> In verse, I was right there. Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. You see the last sentence in verse 17. It doesn't benefit, so faith by itself is not an act of faith. That's an intellectual faith. That's an ideal faith. So faith without works, faith without activity, faith without actions is a dead faith. There must be an activity of faith that participates in conjunction with the saving work of the Word of God. If you have faith in God and He changed your life, you know He can change somebody else's life. If you got faith in God that He can meet your need, you know He can help you meet somebody else's need. If you have faith in God, you're going to show the same mercy that He showed for you. You're willing to forgive because you've been forgiven. You're willing to give because he gave to you. You're willing to walk with somebody because he walks by you. You're you ready to lift somebody because he lifted you. Practical faith will cause you to act like Christ. Practical Christianity, walking, looking, being transformed into the image and conforming to his image. It will show you to love like Christ. It will show you to co have compassion like Christ. It will show you to have the empathy of Christ. It will show you to have the care of Christ. And the example is, he, he says that uh, it's predicated on the deeds of Christ. He loved us so much that he left the throne of glory. He loved us so much that he took a lower position. He loved us so much that he clothed himself in human flesh. He loved us so much that the creator became like the created one. He loved us so much that he came down and looked like you and walked like you and suffered like you. He loved you so much that he went through what you went through. So that you can he could he could let you know I understand what you're going through, and not only that he loved you so much that he died for you. He loved you so much that he took your whooping. <clears throat> he loved you so much that he took your scars. He loved you so much he took your abuse. They spit on him. They were spitting on you. They put a crown of thorns on his head. That was for you. They took his clothes off him and left him naked before the world. That was you being naked before the world. He was hung on the cross between two thieves. You was one of those thieves. He did it for you. That his activity was the promise that he gave. He showed that he was alive, that his, his action proved who he was. Your actions must prove your faith. Faith without works is dead. Faith is not followed by action. He's not talking about works, just doing good deeds. You can't buy, let me, let me clarify that. You can't buy your way into heaven. You can't buy, you, there's not enough good deeds that you can do that can pay your cost. The good thing, your cost has been paid already. But because he transforms you and you accepted him by faith, it's going to motivate you to love like he loved. <clears throat> uh, sometimes I feel a little heavy because I see all the things that are going on around and there's it, nothing we can do, but I can still reach out to one. Uh, there was a story I read when I was doing gang stuff. 
I was working as a probation officer, as a gang probation officer, and I saw this guy, he told a story. The man walked along the seashore, and they had these little, I forgot what they're called, and he was picking them up and throwing them back in the water. He was picking them up and throwing them back in the water, and the person said, why are you doing that? <coughs> it looks impossible. You can't put them all in there. It don't matter that you're throwing one in. He says, it matters to that one. It matters to that one. The one that you pull out the world, it matters to them. You can't save everybody. You can't reach everybody, but the one that you can reach, it matters to them. It's eternal reward for them. It's a life-changing experience for them, and then maybe they can do one. We do it one by one. Love like Christ did. He came to you individually. He spoke to you individually. He talked to you, and you said, I surrender. And then he accepted you. He didn't wait till you got clean. We want somebody to clean, be cleaned up before they come in. He says, come just like you are. I'm going to take you just like as dirty as you are, no matter what you've been going through, I want you to come. Then we'll work on the rest of it. We need to have that same attitude. Come like you are and let him work on the rest of you. Because I was just like them. And I remember, and I can go back and be just like them again if I lose my attitude. If I lose my mind, I'm not, I'm not, I, can't, I don't have all that strength in the world. I have to rely on him to keep me going day by day. How many, how many preachers you see and fail? They feel just like you do because they lose their focus. But as long as my focus is on him, I'm going to walk right. As long as my focus is on him, I'm going to talk right. As long as my focus is on him, I'm going to treat you right. And you will do the same. Let's live practically. Faith without action is dead. So the question is, where is your faith? The question is, is your faith alive? Do your faith need resuscitating? Do you need a jolt from God to wake up your faith? Do you need a touch from God to inspire you again? The cares of the world can weigh you down so much that it can cause you to have just a little bit of faith. But he wants us to increase our faith. He has a meaning. He wants true light to be the true light in this corner of the world. And each one of you are little lights that together we become a bonfire that people can come out of darkness into his light. And each one of you will bear that message, not by what you say, but by your active faith. So we invite you to him. We invite you to come to him. Sometimes we need to rededicate, we need to re-energize. Sometimes somebody needs to be saved. Somebody needs to be saved. Somebody needs to be touched. <coughs> Somebody needs to be prayed for. Whatever your need is right now, he has what you need. And he will move on what you need. <coughs> so he invites you. It's too often we want to see somebody come forward, but I, you stay right where you are. You pray in your heart and it's God to touch you while we pray. I'm not going to tell you to raise your hand and do all that kind of stuff. You pray right where you are for God to meet your need. Whatever your need is, as we bow our heads and we pray, our eyes are closed, we're not looking, and we focus on what God, what did you say to me today? <coughs> what did I get that you wanted me to have? <coughs> Lord, we're here, all of us collectively, we're your children. You came, you spoke to each and every one of us, you called us by our name. We accepted your call. Lord, we're in this world, there's so many things going on that can cause us to have a crisis in our faith. But Lord, we're thankful that you are the healer that can touch wherever we are. You know what the needs of your people are. You know why they're here. You know who they are. You know what they're struggling with. You know what the needs are. You know whether their faith has been tested. You know whether they feel discouraged. You know whatever the situation is. All of us from, from, from the front to the back door, you know what each and every one of us need. So we hear, Lord that we would be what you would call us to be. Help us to be that. Help us to go back to our families and our loved ones with the love of Christ, with a faith that meets the needs of each and every one. Help us to meet the needs of this community by our actions, not so much by our words. Help us to be the church of action, the activity of love, that when somebody walks in here, they can feel love, the love of God. Not a put on, not an act, but really the love of God that transforms lives. That's why we're here. 
So, Lord, help us to be who you called us to be. And we'll give you the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. We thank God for you today. <clears throat> I cut it short because we long today. We had a lot of stuff. <clears throat> but hopefully God spoke to your heart today. Uh, he speaks to me all the time. When I'm, when I'm studying and praying, he's talking to me first. He's not just talking to you. He's talking to me first. It has to hit me first. Amen. So we thank God for who he is and what he's done. Sister Annie, come on up. You got a mic? You got to speak into the mic. So the people on the online can hear you. <laughs> uh, do we have any announcements? Women, yeah, on Sunday, women, please come in white. Mother's Day. We have a speaker, uh, Linda Boyd, will be speaking on Mother's Day. You will be blessed by her, I guarantee you. Um, then we have the Word Conference at the end of May. Uh, May 30th through um, May, May 30th through uh, June 2nd, and I think that's about it, right? Amen. Do we have any visitors that would like to stand and say a few words? Well, we want to thank you <coughs> for coming to True Light. And, uh, and with us and enjoy the worship. And we want you to know that you are always welcome anytime. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sister Annie. Amen. We love you and ain't nothing you can do about it. Let's all stand. Let me come with my cold hands. <laughs> Remember Sister Bernice in prayer. She wasn't feeling good this morning. If you want to reach out to her, reach out to somebody this week and talk to them. Let them know that you care about them, especially those we haven't seen. Lord, we're thankful for this day. We're thankful for your people. We're thankful for this moment in time that you brought us all together. We're thankful that we just can speak your word and that you can meet us where we are. Now, Lord, go with us as we leave this place. Guard us, guide us, protect us. Walk into our houses before we get there. Drive in our cars with us. Lord, keep us safe during this week. And Lord, help us to come back with renewed energy, renewed spirit. Lord, uplifting and encouraging one another as we are in this way. Now, may the love of God and the grace shown through Jesus Christ our Lord and the permanent precious presence of the Holy Spirit be with us as we go from this place. <coughs> and we all sang together. <coughs> God bless you. Bible study, Wednesday, 6, prayer meeting at 6. <coughs> Bernice, good singing. Let me turn this off. Put you, put you all on.